in order for this video to come together nicely, I'm going to ask you to watch the top left hand corner of the screen for any messages that I add to qualify what I'm saying. And please also direct your attention to the bottom of the screen where I will put up a ticker because in this video there will also be a reading because in this video I am not alone even though I am alone. But no, I've got Michael McCarthy with me here today. <clears throat> Sorry, not quite. <laughs> I've got Michael McCarthy's Lelia Crispa here with me today. And while I work with my Lelia Crispa and do some little bit of a commentary and setup change for her, I am going to show you Michael McCarthy's Lelia Crispa because this video has been a long time in the making in my mind, but my Crispa wasn't playing ball until now, three years later. So you will be seeing comparisons and somehow I am sure it'll all come together and I hope that you enjoy the video. Thank you so much for joining me, us, let me say, our CRISPAs together. As you can see, mine is in a pathetic state. And I'm going to show you a picture of the comparison of the two CRISPAs in January of 2022. Right now, on the left is my CRISPA, on the right is Michael McCarthy's CRISPA. When Michael sent me his image, I took a picture of mine. I know, it's crazy, right? How long a video can take to manifest itself, but that is the way with the orchid hobby. A couple of months ago, I did an update on my seedlings and I showed my CRISPA very, very briefly, and I wasn't very hopeful. But my channel is called Ninja Orchids for one of two reasons, and one of them being that orchids are like ninjas. They grow in stealth mode, and then out of nowhere, they surprise you. And well, my CRISPR has surprised me. And what we're going to do today is change her setup. And then I will also update you on the other two from Map by Nature that are in a similar setup. And I believe that my CRISPR is going to be much, much happier in just lava rock and semi-hydro. While I get my orchid out, however, and do a little bit of cleanup, here comes the reading and everything additional is going to be in the ticker. Okay. This is Lelia Crispa Care, as per Michael McCarthy. And please be reminded that this was in November of 2022. And yes, my bad. However, if anything has changed, I am sure Michael will update us in the comments. The CRISPR is currently in the indoor grow space, so I can more closely regulate the conditions. It is 38 centimeters below the outer edge of the bloom spot SL600, equivalent to Mars Hydro TS600 grow light, yielding a looks of 8,000 par should be 485. The temperature range is 23.3 degrees Celsius to 26.6 degrees Celsius, and the humidity ranges from 45 to 65 percent. Currently planted in a 75-25 ratio mix of classic Orchiata 6 to 9 millimeter bark and small perlite sponge rock, same size as the Orchiata bark, in a 6.5 centimeter pot. It gets watered every four days with 325 parts per million, Jack's 2 part, which equals 200 parts per million of calcium nitrate and 125 parts per million of 5, 12 and 26 NPK at a pH of 6.4 to 6.8. The pH is adjusted using potassium silicate, which gives me 65 parts per million of nitrogen. It will get a flush once per month, at which time he adds 50 parts per million of Epsom salt and five milliliters of liquid seaweed to 19 liters of RO water. If it looks a bit dry between watering, he spritzes the surface of the media on day two with a bit of pH adjusted to seven pH tap water, which he keeps in a spray bottle for eventualities. So there you go, that is the care uh, per Michael McCarthy for his Lelia Crispa. You can tell that in my setup, I had Ceramis in a semi-hydro setup. Well, clearly that has not gone down very well. Several reasons that I have deduced from these years of watching her decline bit by bit. One of them would be that she needed a long time to acclimate, much, much longer than I anticipated. And then, without even realizing it, the setup was just too wet. Now, I do not grow my orchids as a rule in a wet-dry cycle, but I can manipulate a semi-hydro setup to not be as wet as with Ceramis. The reason I chose Ceramis is because 
It is highly water retentive and I want seedlings to have a lot of humidity around them because, well, seedlings need a lot of humidity around them even if you grow in a climate with great humidity. Meanwhile, when I got this seedling, I had zero humidity to speak of that would make her comfortable. So with the setup of Ceramis only, I thought I could create a nice humid little microclimate around this orchid so that she will be happy, not realizing that maybe the Ceramis was a little bit of an overkill when it came to humidity for the roots. Now, Yes, there has been a gradual decline. She tried to grow a growth earlier in the season. That didn't amount to anything. And I believe that we are in business with this side because I have never seen this orchid grow roots like this in my collection before. This is a first. So I'm very, very hopeful. I have not been as aggressive with my fertilizer as Michael McCarthy. I'm always a little bit wary when an orchid comes in new and then has to deal with my conditions. It's a seedling. So I'm very conservative with my fertilizer and I always had her at 100 parts per million. I had her at sea with seaweed as well. But seeing as there was not much movement, there was more flushing going on than actual fertilizing. Clearly, without any roots, there's no point in fertilizing anything because where is it gonna go? It's just gonna sit in the media and become all salty and nasty. So I flushed this orchid a lot. Now, sometimes I accept that some orchids take a lot longer to grow beyond the acclimating time frame, and I always calculate 12 to 15 months. But yeah, this is this was a little bit exaggerated. She was just not happy. And then of course, in the winter, I cannot provide the light because all that changed in 2020. When she came into my collection, it was February 2020. So you can imagine, don't have to tell you what happened as from the end of February with the global cooties and all that. And that's when I stopped using my artificial lighting because the financial strain of the utilities, it was not sustainable anymore. So we have a few factors that when my CRISPR arrived as to why she wasn't a happy camper. And you can see the progress on Michael's CRISPR. Wow, now that is what I call successful growing. Now, I am not going to increase my fertilizer despite the example that I see with the images he provided with for me in November of 2022. So I'm sure that his CRISPR by now is looking even more spectacular. And the reason I am not going to up the fertilizer level is because now I have to baby these roots. If I do one mistake, you can see how the pseudobulbs are shriveling. One more mistake, uh, this little crisper is not going to be round anymore. And then this video will just be a wonderful reminder of how circumstances can change in life and how an orchid teaches you about the setup and how you got to it too late. So we need that root. And I'm not going to fuss with her too much anymore. I just wanted to get that black stuff out of her pseudobulbs while protecting the new growth. I don't want to be misting any garlic alcohol on her just yet. And her grooming has been so, so minimal because I didn't want to move her. You saw how I took her out of the pot. <laughs> I just had to lift her out. I didn't even need to squeeze the pot, so. Oh, hello. You are kidding me. Look at that. Okay, garlic alcohol it is. I'll be right back. Always have several paintbrushes at hand. <laughs> yeah, you are kidding me. Just as well. You see, when I said I don't move her, I meant it. I think we got to them in time before they burst open and exposed all their little bebés. Yuck. So I have her nice little pot here. I'm going to put my wire in a little bit prematurely just so that the jiggling is at a minimum because I will have to tie her to that support. So during my winters, she has to come inside. I normally do not like to have any orchids in semi-hydroponics, the classic style with the drainage holes that need to come inside. I don't want them in this kind of a setup. I prefer the mask and the self-watering because it's neater, it's safer, no accidental dripping. And for that reason, I put my tag where the semi-hydroponic holes are so that if I have to move her from the shelf during the winter, I know how to lean her <laughs> just so that there's no dripping. But you see, the thing is, with this setup, I'm anticipating that I'm gonna be able to keep her drier because of the lava rock. 
and I don't want to be repotting her again for many years so I do want to have her more in the middle okay let's try that again I'm going to sponge off Michael McCarthy being a big part of this video and I'm going to ask you to like the video, give it the reflection of the fact that Michael McCarthy was included in this video. This man helps everybody in the orchid community so, so much. So like the video and if you have not subscribed yet, my goodness, please do. Because there are some orchid hobbyists out there that have a bank of knowledge loaded in the comments of our videos. They themselves don't post videos on YouTube and well, my channel is a gateway for those kinds of growers as well. And once again, even though it might take a little bit of time because I need my orchids to be doing something to be able to have a comparison, just know that all of that together is a wonderful reason to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much in advance. Well, that looks really messy. I don't like the aesthetics at all, but okay, I'm gonna have to look past that for now because at least she's secure and the leaf is not pinched. She is not sliding down, that's important. Maybe I can scooch her down a little bit. Just because I've removed a lot of the humidity buffer. I don't want her that high because, you know, I won't always have high humidity in my climate. It's just a fraction, but that's the fraction that we need. Okay, I didn't think I was going to add water, but the way the lava rock is already touching that root tip there, we're going to be adding her water into the pot so that the lava rock doesn't do that much damage. No abrasions, not at this stage, because from what I can tell in her history, two or three roots per growth, that is all she's got in her. We need all of them. So I'm just moving one piece of lava rock away from that root tip so it can find its way down without touching the lava rock so prematurely. So this is Lelia Santhina from Matt by Nature. I'm still struggling with black spotting on the leaves. Yes, she came with them, but I'm hoping to make sure that nothing transfers onto the other leaves. Same setup, just lava rock in semi-hydroponics. Smaller rocks in a small pot, it works. She's doing fabulously, except for the black spotting. Let me move you out of the way, scooch you. You see here, all that beautiful new root growth. Look at that, absorbing nicely. Even though I'm very conservative on the fertilizer, mentioned that before, 100 parts per million, you can see that there's still some salt residue on the surface of the media. So I'm glad that she has come this far. I'm glad that we have active roots that are absorbing. It's gonna be okay. Oh, by the way, <laughs> piece de resistance. New growth coming as well, which is awesomeness. Here's the Cattleya Maxima variety Cerula, also from Matt. Look at that. No spotting, thank goodness. New growth. Happy days. Little bit of salt buildup. And we have one, two active roots in the pot. With the new growth, we'll probably get two more. And then bit by bit, she'll grow to strength. Same setup. Having seen how it's working beautifully for these two, I am encouraged for the CRISPR. The other two live indoors. They were very poorly. They're not ready to be in the outdoors. You know, you would say, well, your CRISPR is even worse off. Yeah, but she's been outdoors throughout this entire growing season. So I'm gonna put her back on the shelf where she started to show this positive activity. I'm not going to be mollycoddling her now and changing her location and then something were to happen. She's accustomed to that place and she's going back in that place. I always have her in the brightest light I can afford her without any direct sun, be that indoors or outdoors. However, my winter temperatures do drop to 14 degrees Celsius where she lives indoors. That can happen day after day, sometimes a week, 10 days in a row. But we are at the end of August right now. I have September, October until mid-November to go. In two and a half months, I'm hoping that her now new roots will start to be active and absorbing by then. And then we'll just have to hope 
for the winter. There's a lot of hope with my CRISPR, but as you could see by Michael McCarthy's CRISPR, his is clearly cooking with gas. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this video, Michael. It's been a long time coming. I appreciate your patience with this project very, very much. I know that you're a patient man because you grow orchids, but that doesn't mean I need to take advantage of it. But anyway, if you want to continue following the progress of the two CRISPRs, let us know in the comments because El Jefe will be reading comments, hopefully getting some feedback, maybe some questions that he can answer directly for you if you grow in bark. And then, of course, if the feedback is such that you want regular updates of our two CRISPRs, I am sure that we can accommodate that. Isn't that right, Michael? Not going to speak for you. <laughs> it could be that maybe in January we can do another update because your January 2022 picture to the comparison of your November 2022 pictures, I have a feeling you've got a blooming size CRISPR by now. Well, not quite, but you know what I mean. Thank you so, so much for watching. I appreciate that you were here with me on the patio in gorgeous southern Spain while these conditions last. Let me wish you, please, a wonderful day on that one condition, though, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.